Welcome back. Let's go ahead and we will spend some time kind of thinking about oh, just more of the features of Navisworks and how we can use it and how you can get some control over like all the information that's available like in Navisworks. And for me, as I think about Navisworks and working with Navisworks, one of the biggest challenges is it's so versatile in terms of what's going on. There's so much complexity available that it's almost hard to figure out how to focus on specific aspects and control that information so that you can really get towards what you want. So you guys are mentioning some interesting examples, things like uh, trying to find all the information related to a specific trade and color code it so you can sort of see how it all works together and you know, access specific parts of the model so that if you think about a big hospital project like you guys are working on, you know, there are just really, I don't know, do you, you know how many models they merge together? I'm curious. So, it's like, it's, it's probably 30 or 40. It's a lot of models. A lot of models. And it's thousands of elements. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of elements. So yeah. it's overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. Even think about how you can access all that information. So it really, you know, it's essentially. Like 800,000 square feet of infrastructure. It's just, it's, yeah, you, you can't, you, the your mind can't even sort of comprehend it. Yeah, like even the model is, it's pretty hard to find yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, that's actually kind of what we want to focus on today is this whole notion of it's kind of ways you navigate around the model and kind of filter the model for what you want to see, as well as uh, being able to search for very specific things. Because, you know, as we bring and integrate together a model, um, all the elements are available in a big tree. But it turns out that's not a really efficient way of accessing the information because a lot of it's just sort of, it's hidden in this sort of weird form that's just a little bit hard to get to. So what I wanted to do today is really, okay, go back to uh, where we were last time in terms of just getting started. We were thinking about, you know, there's this whole notion of creating an integrated model. And the big thing there was really, we exported the models as MWC files. That was a little more reliable than just opening the Revit file from within Navisworks. It seems to have better fidelity in terms of grabbing all the elements. Okay. Saving that integrated model, creating a Navisworks project, and obtaining them all in there. And as we were doing that, it generally worked out okay. There were just a couple things that could sort of make our life a little bit harder or easier in terms of pulling those models together. The good news is, as we're going through and kind of bringing all the models in, we can get AutoCAD files, we can get Revit files, we can get Tecla files, we can get IFC files. It really is quite universal about what it can pull together. The hardest part we usually let into just has to do with coordinates and alignment. And if people haven't done a good job of kind of saving everything and using the same coordinate system, you can come to get things that sort of come in in odd ways. So let me just kind of show you an example. This is, I'll give you this example, like to kind of keep two. We're just going to build off the examples we were looking at last time. But it's one of the models that's kind of, oh, in that collection. Well, I put the Revit models in here too. This is a little building uh, you see used to always kind of talk about having 40 simulation, but this is actually a model that was done by students in the class in 128. Um, that's a structure that belongs to this architectural model. So those things are together, and there's even a little MEP model that goes with it. The idea is it's kind of a mixed use building. We've got some retail on the bottom, a little bit of office space on the top. So it's a nice little kind of basic building. It's not a very big building, but it's just enough complexity to kind of be interesting. As we try to keep these models in sync, one thing that's really useful is as we link the models and kind of hang them all together is that they have a shared coordinate and grid system. So you'll see that in my architectural model is a grid system, A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four as well as in the structural system. It's also there. And that turns out to be really useful. So as we transfer this information to Navisworks, the important thing is you've got to go to a 3D model, some sort of model that has all the elements visible. So if I don't want the Navisworks model to have the furniture, I turn off the furniture and visibility graphics. Whatever it is I want to include or don't want to include based on complexity. Because if you're trying to do an analysis where you don't want all 800,000 objects, you only want 1,000 that you care about, you can filter things out and just do the class detection and focus on those. But as we look at this, you generally get things like in this 3D model. And as we say export it, 
big thing is, again, if you have Navisworks installed, say Navisworks 2015, and it gives you these options. Okay. By default, these are actually pretty good options, but the only time I ever change this is if I've added a lot of custom parameters and properties, things that I was trying to use to tag specific things, I added a vendor field, or I added sort of a specification section field for different elements to cross-reference things, then I'll want to save those too. So for the most part, you can just accept the defaults. If you do want to bring those things, the additional properties, it's this guy right here, convert element properties, which starts to be important. That should be checked. That will give you all the element properties, not just the defaults. So bring them all across is generally kind of a really good choice. If you've broken it into construction parts, we can turn that on too. But so I have this guy, great, I save it. I save it as an NWC file and I created this arc model over there. So once I save out that NWC, when I go over to Navisworks, it's gonna show you just you know one special little thing that happens here. Let's see if I can find my Navisworks. Autodesk. Where are you hiding from me? Kepler. Navisworks managed, there it is. You get all these 3D objects put up here. My, up here, model also has um, grids. Those will come across too. Okay. So I just want to illustrate that because that can become really useful to you when you're trying to pull models together. Because if you have two different models and they're out of sync with each other, they come from two different sources and they're not in sync, it's really helpful you have some element that is common to your model and the other models so you can really use it as a reference point. It's almost like you know, the survey point, the base point of the drawing that you want to use. So it's really nice to you to be able to go ahead and have that common element. I swear I opened that. But maybe not. Yeah, or just use the grids to do that. So hang on over here again. I think we are, but I don't know. I don't see it opening. opening for me. This is just me and my little uh, goofy setup right here with the PC and the Mac side going all over the place. Strange. Okay, let me switch this over a little bit. Can we be accessing that building? Nah, I was I was going to show. You. This is a throwaway in terms of just really uh, just trying to demonstrate something really quickly. So basically, you got that thing in there. I don't have the MWC file for you out there. Let me go ahead and open up Navisworks here. We'll see if it'll open. Finally, okay. What I wanted to show you is that when you bring it in, the grids will be available, so you can start uh, playing around. So here we have the Navisworks environment. Okay, you'll see there's nothing currently hanging around in my selection tree. Your Navisworks environment may not look like this right now because I have the save viewpoints open. Yeah, that's a choice. The selection tree windows open. The main drawing area is just kind of hanging around looking pretty blank right now. So don't worry if yours doesn't look exactly the same. We can sort of close those things and reopen them. 
But what we are going to do is go to home and say we're going to append in. And I'm going to append in this architectural model again. You don't have that right now. Just kind of watch along. I just want to show you that really what happens here is we actually have a grid system in there. And that grid system can come in very, very useful. The idea is when we have the grid system in there and we can sort of use that as a point of reference, and it seems to take the first grids of the first model that you've loaded in there. Okay, we can use this to help us. As I go through and add in another file, for example, I'm going to add in the structural file. If all is good, things line up well. Things like the uh, footings end up right under the columns and everything's kind of happy. Okay. Um, if things aren't necessarily quite so good, let me just turn on the selection tree. You can sort of see the different models that I have loaded here right now. I can go ahead and take that. I can delete that if I want to get rid of it for right now. Take it out right now. I can add in. I have another set here. And again, don't you worry about it right now as much as I have one where what I've done is I've shifted the survey point. That really just sort of port, uh, shifts the coordinate system off relative to uh, the architectural model. So if I do that one where I've purposely sort of put it off in a different uh, displacement. Yeah, you may get something that looks like that. And that's the only thing I want to sort of really do with this is really kind of show you. If you have something like that going on, then you ultimately have to sort of figure out really what the difference is between this one's coordinate system and that one's coordinate system, and hopefully try to bring them back in sync with each other. It's a little hard to do in 3D, because in 3D, you kind of look in, it's a little bit hard to measure in terms of what's going on. It may be helpful for you, in this case, to shift to a top view. Top view tends to be a little bit easier in terms of what's going on. Okay. You have the notion of whether you're showing the grid or not. That's kind of fine. But let me again just sort of zoom on out here a little bit. It's actually kind of hard to tell right now you know, what the difference is. I want to show you that you can turn on orthographic, but orthographic seems like it doesn't want to turn on this, and I'm just a little stuck in terms of why that isn't kind of turning on right now. Because at least then we wouldn't have the perspective to worry about. It would actually come through a little more neatly. Okay. But the trick is, what we really want to do is take this model here and displace it and bring it on over. And that is, and under item tools, we can take a model and it's called transforming it. So we can move the model at which point you could go ahead and just try dragging it into place. But the better thing is, if you can figure out numerically what the displacement is, is to go through and, let me undo that just so it's back to wherever it was. Yeah, go through and put things in. Notice though, as you're putting things in, watch out for the whole notion of whether it's meters or feet, because that would get you in trouble. I know when I mess this up, I shifted it 40 feet off and 40 feet in the other direction. So I can just go ahead and type in 40. And if I just leave 40, it'll assume meters, which will get me in trouble. So I'm going to put the feet in there. Put 40 feet in the other direction, too. Okay, And it's sort of back where it should be. Okay. But the big trick is hopefully someone is going to go through and register those models for you in terms of trying to figure that out. The other way to fix it, which may be a better way to fix it, is as follows. You know, as you go back over to the underlying Revit model and even check out the structural model, let me go ahead and check out the structural model. You can use visibility graphics to turn on for the site there's really two very important points you want to sort of know about. There's something called the base point and then the survey point. And really those are the two things that control sort of the relative of displacements of things, yeah, and how the whole measurement system is calibrated. 
The base point's really kind of the origin of your whole coordinate system. The survey point is kind of the common registration point between two different files. Okay, so here, my survey point is offset from my base point. Okay, and you can see, oh, my base point is from the survey point off 40. So the probably better thing to do is, or one way to address this is to go through and just go ahead and move these things so they're in sync with each other. So I'll bring it over there 40 and I'll bring it down 40. Okay. Now if I exported it, it would be back in alignment. So I have a choice. I can either sort of fix the coordinate system or over at Navisworks, I sort of apply what the offset is to kind of compensate for the bad coordinate system. Kind of whatever way it is that yeah, you hear from you. Yeah. Some of you on your projects, we have this problem where when things came together, they didn't quite line up right. And that was okay, just this way of basically publishing one file's coordinates that will be the master of the relationship and subscribing on the other side and then say we're going to use a shared coordinate system. And that sort of does the same thing. So whatever kind of works. Okay. If you don't want to use the grid lines, and the grid lines are kind of hard in that you only get the ones from the first like project. So it's a little bit hard to kind of make that happen. What you can do is just go ahead and put in a line, but I want to put in a very special kind of line. Drawing lines, if I think about drawing, if I want to sort of establish, for example, a common point of reference that will be the same on all the different drawings, but very visibly be the same. Okay, here's what you can do. You would like to put some sort of like, basically crosshairs, some sort of registration point. Okay, if you do it with a detail line, it was only sort of there for the purpose of one view. It doesn't, it's only understood as an annotation. It doesn't really have real meaning. But model lines are actually sort of very useful things to you. Model lines are lines that actually have true 3D meaning and they do transfer. So if you, for example, put a model line out here at level one, and even over there, okay, I might want to align those to be in alignment with my grid lines. You'll now start having lines that can actually be used as points of reference for dragging and kind of pulling things together. Because if you put those model lines in several different things, you know, one of the easiest way to align things isn't to figure it out numerically, it's just to drag a line around top of the other. Okay, so that's the point here. So if you go through and you say this, we'll go to 3D, notice the green little model lines are hanging out there. So if I save this, out here to Navisworks. Notice as it's exporting to Navisworks, it kind of counts up all the different elements that it's finding. This is actually one of the ways that you know you're in trouble if you just open the Revit file. It's quite weird when you open the Revit file whether you get all 645 elements or not. People have very mixed reactions. We sort of discovered this in the PBL class that you didn't always get everything that you thought you were going to get. But if I now go through and I append this one with the model lines, it should be there. Let's see if we got it. Take that back. I'm not seeing my model lines. Why am I not seeing my model lines? I exported it. That should be okay. Let me hide this one. Let me even hide this one. Hmm. I'm going to be upset about why model lines didn't come in just a minute because I've used that in the past as a way of like a... Uh, hmm. Although they seem to be over there. Let's come back over to, again, our export options. Let's see if there's anything hanging around in there. Okay, in terms of the model, the 
let's see what it's doing. File construction this, element IDs, convert linked files, URLs. No, I don't believe that'll make a difference. I could be certainly be wrong, but I don't think that really will make a difference. We'll try. Coordinates, colors, textures. Although, oh, hang on, let's come back over here. Never assume, I've learned that. In terms of the viewpoint, Oh, it's rendered. Let me try shaded for a second. Hmm, I want that to be on right now, this ability to turn on and off the display of lines. It's oh, let me try over here. You're going to be very confused about why those model lines aren't showing up right now. I think it's the sectioning. Oh, no. Hmm. This should be coming through. I don't know. I am very confused about like why those aren't. Well, that's why we're test driving all this. They're model lines, they're there, blah, blah, blah. They're certainly there in visibility graphics. Don't know. I'll try one other kind of attack on this. Let's do this. Per your suggestion, Nicholas, let's go ahead and save the project. I'm going to save it, okay, okay, with model lines out there. Remember there were like 945 elements or something like that in here. Let's go ahead and in Navisworks, try appending. And what you can actually do is as opposed to appending the NWC file, append the Revit model. It'll be, we'll have to find RVT files. Watch out for that with Navisworks. There's this whole notion that this file type, and there's so many different file types, you have to have the selector come into the right type. Let's come over here. Well, why are you importing the Revit model of the Navisworks? We're, we're trying to figure out why the model lines didn't come over. So I'm trying, this is, as opposed to doing the NWC file, this is really the opposite way of doing it, which is you say open the Revit file. It should sort of work out about the same. This is the one that I think that usually has less uh, fidelity in terms of coming through. Okay. But no, it is there. Notice it came out of the Revit model. But I don't know. I am not certain. Again, let's not worry about it now. I'll see if I can come up with an answer for what's going on there. You know, we don't like when things don't work. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about what I wanted to talk about today, which is really just in Navisworks, how you work with a model. And there's a couple of big things you kind of really explore there, and there's a different model, and if you do have, oh, Nicholas, you do not have. Let's go ahead and put it on the blue one. Try looking on here. There's something, I think it's called Session 1 Examples or something like that. Try digging in there. I think it's on there. Yeah. What I want to focus on is really just within Navisworks, things about views, selections, viewpoints, and ultimately 
and do little walkthroughs to kind of get your way through the model. And to play with this, what I actually want to do is use a model that's for something called the uh, convention center. Let's kind of see if we can open that up and we'll sort of play around. So what I'm going to do is to say new, because I don't want to kind of continue working with my little low rise model right now. And let's just start in this whole system in terms of what's going on back in here. Yeah, right now, again, you have these different panes and you have the drawing area. You have the drawing area for right now. It has a big old black background. It has the view cube. It has like the navigation bar over here. And some of those tools should be somewhat familiar. As you go through and append in different sort of files, so you go out and bring different pieces in using the can opener. Say, let's go to Conference Center. I'll go to the Navisworks files. I'm going to switch that over to an NWC file. Let's see if I can find where it went. I think it's scrolled up past the top there. Okay, I'm going to get the architectural model, bring it on in. Okay, you'll see I'm looking at the architectural model, I'm kind of looking at it sort of dead on right now. As we kind of look at that model, a couple different things we can do. One thing I can do is over here on the view cube, I can turn on the home view, looking like that. Okay, I can go switch around to front or right or any of those different views. Okay. Can also go ahead and kind of just use the view cube or the uh, navigation wheel to go through and do anything we're sort of used to, like orbiting. And all the same rules, like we're used to working in Revit, should work pretty much the same. So whether we're orbiting or panning, whatever it is, we have all the information in that model showing. Yeah, maybe more information than we want to show. We'll start filtering the app a little bit. But we have all the information in the architectural model there. Okay, this one will actually work. In terms of the view itself, there's a couple of things I want to kind of show you there. In the, under the view menu, which controls this big black arrow right now, you have the whole idea, do you want to see the navigation bar? Do you want to see the view view? And again, clicking on those, we'll just sort of turn those on or off in the interface, just depending upon what you like. OK, that's OK. Other things you might want to play around with are just even the whole background of this space. The background of this space right now is this big old black void, which some people like. If you actually prefer to look at that a little bit differently, I think, Andy, when you opened up in that NWD file we opened last week, it came up looking a little bit different. Yeah. Where in here, let's see if I can find it in here. Well, that's because I opened the wrong file. Well, that's okay, but no, it's, it's, I want to show you how you can sort of get to that point productively, because it actually, it, where, where you got to is a valid point. If you just right click on the background, the blah, the area, you can choose background and choose whether you want it to be a plain background, whether you want it to be graduated, okay, which is giving it sort of more just a color fill, depending if you like that. Or what some people tend to like is something that looks like a horizon line. Okay. And when I'm looking sort of in this helicopter view, it doesn't make much sense, but as you sort of pivot on over, some people like that horizon line because it just gives you a better sense of perspective. Actually, Nicholas, did you find the, uh, were the files on there? Yes. Good. Okay. I need to install that. Okay. Very good. Okay. So we have this. You can start controlling the view just in terms of what's happening here. I'm going to distinguish between the view and view points where viewpoints are saved camera positions. Okay, so the view is kind of this overall drawing environment where the viewpoints start to be the features of the individual cameras. And every camera can have its own properties. Okay, one other thing that's kind of very useful here is you can go ahead and turn on the uh, axes if you want to see those, even the position readout in terms of what the X, Y, Z of where we're looking right now is. But one that's probably more useful is this one here, the reference views. You can turn on a plan view or a section view. And what's going to happen is as we move around, let me show you in plan view. Um, 
basically, as we move around, we should be able to sort of see where we are in plan. In this case, it's just a plan view of the whole building. Now, let's kind of keep that hanging around. Or even better, uh, update the current viewpoint. Actually, maybe it's, this will make more sense after we create a viewpoint. As you bring in more and more information, for example, let's go ahead and bring in, I have my little uh, view or my navigation wheel sticking to me, so I'm going to hit the selection, which kind of turns that off. Theoretically, you should also be able to hit Shift W to turn that in and on and off, but I sometimes have trouble with that. Um, let's go ahead and under the Home tab, append in another file. You can go ahead and bring in the structure file if you want to. Okay, and you start to see the structure working together with that. So it's just, it's just called the Conference Center, and then there's like two different files, so when you append, there should be architecture, MEP, and structure. So as we are bringing all this information together, which is actually pretty useful, okay, you have these view settings. That's the whole background, whether or not the view cube is in there, whether or not you have these reference views. That's kind of good. The next step that you really sort of tend to come to is this whole notion that, hey, I'd like to actually be able to select some specific model elements and start filtering things out. Because as I start thinking about this model, there's really an awful lot of complex information in here. So let's think about how you can do that. You can select anything just by choosing kind of an element. If you click on an element like that big old wall, you'll see that it's part of the architectural file right now. It's this specific wall. If I go through and I click on the roof surface, you'll see it'll kind of go to the point in the tree, the selection tree. If you don't have selection tree right now, it's one of the things that's available on the Home tab. You can sort of choose to display the tree or not. Actually, let me comment on these little sub-windows. For these sub-windows, if you don't want it to keep on going away, you can pin it, and then it will be there and kind of keep on hanging out on the side of the screen. Actually, then it goes ahead and collapses when you want it. Yeah, unpin it. That allows it to collapse. Uh, okay, so choosing things like individual items, if you want to see what that is, that looks like it's some sort of lightweight concrete down on the first floor. From the structural model, that seems to be all, that seems to be some sort of surface, probably the topology, or topography, that's coming out of the architectural model. You, know, you can kind of look at things that way, but you can also go through and use this tree to kind of hide or show different things. So for example, at a high level, if you just want to go ahead and take the structural model and just not look at it right now, you can right click and say that you want to hide it. Okay, or if you choose to hide again, it'll unhide it. The other way is to hide or unhide the selected. So for example, I can go through and hide the structure. Maybe in the architecture, I could choose to hide, oh, everything that's related to the sixth floor, the fifth floor, maybe even the fourth floor, and choose to hide those. So the whole game in this is really starting to control the information that's available out here. You're hiding it or showing it or colorizing it or 
analyzing it, whatever it is, it's going to give you the information that you need to be looking at right now. That tends to work out pretty good in terms of hiding and unhiding. Where the difficulty tends to come is just this organization here is not familiar. It's kind of really awkward and even here, I seem like I got rid of some things, but there's other things that are still sort of there. It's a little unclear where some of the information is associated and where it lives in this tree. So just sort of selecting things explicitly to kind of hide and unhide gets to be a little bit tricky. And that's really what I think the biggest challenge is in Navisworks is just the selection tree unto itself actually gets to be just a little unwieldy, just because it doesn't look the way you're used to looking in Revit. It has all these different things that are kind of scattered around in here. Even in this model, you might have a list of 50 different models here. You might have a hard time finding what it is, where you need in that list of all of them. So you might have some faster ways of going through and doing that. So as we think about our models and we're selecting our model elements in the tree, you can browse the tree. You can hide and unhide. That's kind of cool. You can even turn on something called the Selection Inspector. What that does for you is, if you select something like this guy over here, and you say that you want to open the Selection Inspector, let me go ahead and see if I can find it, down there in the bottom of the menu, it'll tell you a little bit about it. It's just one item that's there. You can save the selection if you want to. It just sort of gives us a little bit of information about what it is. If you have several different things selected. So does it tell you the information of the designer plugged in? Like, can it tell you how much money it costs and how much time does it take to install? Or? Well, it does ultimately in terms of the properties, but sometimes a little hidden from you. OK, so you say selection inspector. OK, and it's just giving you the name and the type there in terms of what's going on. If you want to start seeing some other information, though, we want to kind of be looking at it a little bit differently. So even from this guy over here, you see it in the tree, you know, there's these different solids, okay, but it's not really all the properties you'd want. And that's because, actually, as we go looking around over here, there's different versions of this tree. There's the standard version, which is really organizing everything in terms of the spatial elements, but it's not showing you all the properties. You really sort of want to see the properties behind all this thing. Okay. So what you can do, though, is switch over to a different view called the properties view. Okay. And in the properties view, you can start seeing all sorts of different elements and all the different properties that define them. So if, for example, Okay, one of the things that we went through and put in there for each of the different elements was a vendor or a schedule code or a work breakdown structure code or something like that. We can find that property over here. And then as we go through and look for all the potential values of it, okay, you can sort of see everything that sort of has different values and the values that have been assigned somewhere within the model. So there's a lot of different fields in here. And this is the point where we can start customizing, adding as many different fields as we want. Some fields only apply to a few things, like seat back material and seat material. That's only going to apply to a few furniture pieces. Okay. Other things are sort of much more kind of general. There's element properties. There's item properties. Everything has a name. Everything has some layer, potentially has a material. So even if you go under here, you can see there's the list of all the different names, every item that's considered to be part of that project. OK, or, oh, what is it? Everything that has the unit feet, that's not going to be very interesting. Source file is going to be the file that it actually came from. Layer is kind of really what level it's on right now. So we can say, show me everything that's considered to belong to the first floor, the third floor, the sixth floor, whatever it is. Okay. But the game is really going ahead and trying to figure out how to use this uh, selection tree to our advantage. And here's what you got to do. 
Okay, you can go ahead and find anything in the tree just by hunting around. And when you find all those things, you can either say select all, you can say select none, you can say select everything that's the same. Okay, so for example, if I grab that guy and I say select same things like of the same type, it should find all these things are considered to be screen panels. Okay, they're elements of screen panels, so you sort of see there's uh, some of the uh, glazing, you're seeing uh, some of the structure that's supporting it. All those things have the same type. You can come over here and choose that wall, and if you say select all the things that are of the same, the same name would be everything that actually has the same name. This is they're all called exterior brick on um, metal studs. Okay. If I go through and choose something else over here, oh, for example, that looks like some sort of column, a 25 by 25. I say select everything that has the same name. Okay, it's going to grab all those like ones and start grabbing them. So as you go through and find things that are interesting, super. Okay, you can grab them over here. You would love to be able to save those because you don't want to have to keep on going out and finding them every time. So you want to be able to kind of create a set that contains all those. Okay, and that's where we want to go next. If you say save the selection, was that? Oh, no worries. If you say that you want to save the selection, super. Okay, we can get to it again. Let's try that. We'll save a selection. Okay, and these are going to be all my columns, 25 by 25. So super. These are all set. Okay, so later on, I choose something else. They're not selected. I choose them again. They're all selected again. So. Saving things as sets is really the first important thing you can do. And saving things as sets is actually pretty good. For example, over here, I can go through and choose that. I can say select all the same name. And then I'm going to say save that as a selection. And this is going to be my exterior brick walls. Okay. And You'll come up with your own scheme in terms of how you name these things. We can create little folders to kind of group things. So these are going to be my structural elements. And whatever it is that's going to make it easier for you to find these things. So I'll go ahead and put the columns in that folder. I'll go ahead and say, oh, these are all my walls. And I'll put the brick walls in there. Okay. And everything seems like it's kind of moving along pretty swimmingly. Okay, we're getting the hang of this. We can go do this. Kind of create these different sets, and that's kind of okay. And things are looking really grand until you go ahead and you update the model. Okay, so the designer gives you a new version of the architectural model, and you pull it on in there and say, let's grab all those brick walls, and you select them. And like some are selected, but some aren't selected. That's how about it is. This is actually when you choose things explicitly and you save them using save set, it's an explicit selection. Okay, so it is those brick walls that have a specific ID number that exists today. Great as long as nothing changes. If you go back and some of those walls got deleted, okay, great, they're not going to be in the selection. Super, that's okay. But if new walls got added that you think should be part of that set, okay, they won't be in it, okay, because they're not part of the explicit list. Okay, so this whole thing, explicit selection, great starting point, but not nearly as powerful as you want in the long run. Okay, good to get going for everything. Whatever you know, whatever you got that. For, and even if you just have some ad hoc selection, it's really you know this one and this one. Oops. This one and why am I always selecting everything?
that one and control click that one. Great, there is explicit, yeah, whatever. These are some of, uh, curtain wall supports. Whenever you're doing things ad hoc, great. Go ahead and pop it in, do just like this, you know. Things are sort of fine. But when you want to start having more power, that's where you're going to do something a little bit different. And the cool thing is, you're not far off from what you need. You just sort of need to kind of think a little bit differently. If we thought about our sets not being explicit selections, we thought about just defining some criteria and just querying the database and pulling everything that matches those criteria. So find me everything that has the name computer monitor, or find everything that has the name desk chair. Okay. That would be good because that could update itself every time, always querying the database. Okay. So here's how you do that. It's really not all that different. You can say find items okay, right next to these selections. And we can go ahead and start defining some criteria. Okay. In terms of how you define the criteria, right now it's like we're set to layer is equal to the sixth floor, which is probably not what we have in mind. There's different types of categories of information. There's item sort of pieces of information. Things that are related to the item, they're kind of interesting. There's those things that are actually pretty common. Item, it's a category that a property. Things like everything has a name, has a creator, has a file, has a layer or level that it belongs to, has a source file, has a unit system. Those are pretty common. Item things tend to be very uniform or across all the different types of information. Another category that's sort of interesting, and probably the one that's probably the most interesting to me, is just element types of information. Element types of information are, those are all the specific properties that belong to like specific types of elements. So if you want to find everything that has, oh, a specific area or has a specific link or has some specific property, it's made of linen or it's made of brick or something like that, you tend to look under here. So let's try just sort of a simple one. Like one is, okay, let's go for this. We'll say item name. We can say contains. And here's all the different item names. These are the things that are like the types that were available in Revit. You gotta see what's available in here. So if you know that it, for example, wants to contain brick, okay, which will be sort of like the brick walls, or you can go through and choose one of the specific ones in here. You can say find all those items. Okay, it'll find all those items. You can sort of see all the ones selected over here. They're looking pretty good in terms of all the walls. Okay. If you like this criteria and that's feeling pretty good, what you do is right over here in the sets, it looks like a little pair of binoculars. You basically say, let's create something out of these criteria. So you say, great. Let's make a save this search. It's a search set. I can rename it if I want to. Okay, so we'll do something like that again. What we do is you go through and you sort of define the criteria. And then after you define the criteria, you can even sort of say, does it search everything? Does it only search in certain parts of the tree? Do we care about matching the case? But you're defining a database search. And then you're saying new search. And it puts it over here in the list. Okay. And the difference between ones that have the little uh, binoculars and ones that just have the square is that the binocular ones are going to always dynamically research or uh, search sort of based on the updates to the model. So it's to be very useful if you go through and updating things. But in some ways, you know, those two are very similar in terms of the result today. Okay? Those might be dissimilar in the results tomorrow or next week. Because the ones that are sort of explicit will only be the ones in the model today. You know, the ones that are search are really uh, much more powerful. So searching is really the way to go with all this. You ultimately want to do everything by doing a search. So there's other kind of things that you can sort of play around with too. For example, oh, let's say item, 
let's say material. Let's see if we can see what sort of materials are available in here. We have some things that contain concrete or they contain glass or something like that. If I say find all those, okay, there's everything that contains a little bit of glass. Okay, again, that being the standard item kind of a property. Okay, so we can save those away. Say so what? Mine says there's no objects found in glass. Oh, ah, interesting. Are you, is there anything special going on over here in terms of what's selected? Like item material contains glass? It got to be something. Or is, can you see anything with glass? Or is it all, is there something, is it all hidden? Oh, uh, no. The, the, the thing is that I pressed enter, so I went to another line. Oh, so. oh, because you can make these compound criteria. Yeah. So even in here, okay, so let me save this. This is going to be all glass. Let's try this. Let's say the item there, but kind of what Andy did is we can also and put these ands together. We can say that the element sort of area is greater than, and oh, let's say greater than 100 square feet. Okay, so you can start putting these together in terms of very complex criteria. Let's see if anything meets that criteria. No objects found there. Let me try this in terms of, oh, greater than 10. Hang on. You would think that would have the area. Match case, prune below. Oh. Okay, the fact that I'm getting nothing selected right there indicates there's something wrong just, you know, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible to try and limit it down there. Let me try as opposed to doing that as um, kind of a compound thing. Let me just try this again in here in terms of element area is greater than or equal to, say, 50. What do I want to do here? I want to remove that delete a condition, negate a condition, or the condition. Let me delete the condition. Okay, that's everything as it grew. Let's try something a little bit harder. 500. Okay. 5,000. Okay. So, we're going through, and the, the key to this is really defining the different search criteria that match the things that are interesting. So what you want to start thinking about is all the different sets of things that are interesting to you. Just using things like area is kind of interesting in length. You know, you can find everything that's big or anything small, anything that's sort of is easily described in terms of just uh, the element properties. You know, all the elements. That's kind of super. Just kind of put them all together in here. You could also, though, start embedding other information, and that's where it got sort of interesting. So, what's available to search? Okay, item properties, name, type, material, element attributes, area, length. Some that are sort of standard are things like assembly code. We hardly ever pay attention to assembly code, but assembly code is really like a notion of work breakdown structure, where you have some standard uniformat kind of code system for describing different pieces that ultimately there. You can either use that, or you can even start really adding your own kind of properties. And that's what we sort of played around with for folks who are in 120A. We looked at, oh, for scheduling, adding something like a task code, some sort of a schedule code, so that you can say that this element is going to be associated with a certain um, item number in the construction schedule. You can kind of put in work areas or work packages, you can put down work breakdown structure sort of things, or even things like, you know, add a vendor field, add a delivery date, add whatever you want to kind of make the most sense. So it's really just all adding different fields and then they'll become available. So for example, 
what happens is if you come back over to Revit, let me pop back over here, and if you want to add some fields to this that are sort of a little bit different than the ones that are standardly available, let's kind of just take a look at this for example, this is just this floor, you sort of see it has these type properties, it does have things like Keynote, model, manufacturer. You can start embedding information here in any of these standard fields. But where it gets really sort of interesting is that you can start adding fields to this model. So if you want to, here, under Manage, you can say we're going to add some new parameters to this project. You can add parameters to all your projects, too. But if you want to add something Like, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and add a subcontractor field or, you know, contractor. So super, I can decide whether that's going to be a type or an instance. It'll probably be instance because I want to be able to describe, you know, for the whole classes of objects or just in, okay, object by object. Um, I'll sort of put that on everyone. Every item could have a specific contractor associated with it. Let me add another one in there. Um, you know, I could put something like delivery date or vendor or whatever it is that I, you know, supplier. Although supplier, I think, is actually one that's already sort of in there. So if you import this mod, like all this information to the NWF style of importing to Navisworks, will all the information also get passed? Yeah, it'll come as part of it. It's an NWC file. NWC, I mean? Yeah, you're right. So you see over here, here's contractor and supplier. Okay, so you really put as much information here as you can. And in fact, even like some people work with tools like something called BIMLink, which lets you sort of tie in Excel spreadsheets and fill in some of the information. But the idea is, do you really want there to be a database record, which is every piece of information we know about that, product, that item, yeah, and be able to kind of track it there. And when you export this and re-import this as an NWC, or what happens is back over here in Navisworks, all those different fields show up under properties. There's the item properties, or most of them show up as element properties, all these things. So if you have a specific supplier or a specific vendor or something like that, whatever field that you've gone ahead and put in here, you know, you can start to see all the different values that are in here. And what these are is really just sort of selections that are currently in the model. So it actually sorts it out. For example, I guess the, every seat in here is a material textile other. I guess for seat backs, I have some that are uh, slate blue and some that are cherry, which that's pretty silly in terms of what's going on. But let's take a look at some of the other ones. Oh. We can find for all the different windows, what kind of variation do we have in the insets? And they're all about the same in terms of that. But anything you go through and put in here, you know, all the different lighting fixtures of different lumen values, whatever it is, these are all just sort of available here. So if you find something over here that's kind of a nice criteria and you want to work with it, you can actually sort of even see that Let's see if I can find one that's a little bit better. Things that have different diameters. Yeah. Basically, here's how it's defined. The element diameter is equal to two. Oh, cost could be interesting. Is there anything in that? So cost is equal to 75. Great. So we could say that, great, we want to find everything where its cost is greater than 100, whatever it is in there. But if you find a criteria you like, grab it, okay, and then just go save it and then it puts it in that list over here so you can get it again on your short list as opposed to having to go digging around in there. So the game really becomes all about trying to set up these search criteria. If you do that, super, then we can start colorizing the models, we can start assigning materials, we can get all that stuff to space on the search criteria. So that's where really the big advantage to this cap comes. It's really in your, uh, basically, you have the windows that shows all the different uh, selection sets. You have the explicit sets, which are static, and nothing gets added. You have the dynamic sets, which are the search sets, things get added. And you have the auto-save sets, those are the ones that need for property. But 
that is kind of just great though, because that's really useful for you in terms of being able to grab things really quickly. So like what you guys are doing in the meeting, you know, there's 800,000 elements, but what you really want is you want to find all the ones that either have a clash problem, that's sort of a spatial relationship, or we can find all the ones that have a clash that belong to vendor X, or that are from a specific trade, or that are due to be installed in the next two weeks, so that you don't have to kind of deal with you know, hundreds of thousands of things all at once. So selections really are probably the most powerful thing you can kind of do to kind of like uh, play with this. So that'll sort of get you going in terms of like the big power there. Let me kind of just dive a little bit into the viewpoint, then we'll let you kind of go off for today in terms of what's going on. In terms of thinking about the viewpoints, we talked about that a little bit last time, but I want to kind of demonstrate just a little bit more about what they're good for. And that looks like this. Close up my sets right now. So idea is I'm looking over here, and I got my fantastic looking model. Let me go ahead and turn back on the other uh, pieces of it. I want to unhide the structure so you can sort of see everything again. Okay, so it's hanging around out here. Super. As I am looking at my fantastic model here, as much as I like to orbit around and kind of have complete control over it, there's this whole notion that, hey, I'm going to have to save this viewpoint because it's kind of an interesting viewpoint. Was that? That's how they did it in the meeting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like the selection thing and then a, a huge number of viewpoints. Exactly. Right. Okay, so the difference between view being the overall environment and viewpoint being a specific camera is this. You go to viewpoint, you go to whatever view you want over here, including every time you have a clash, you can save a viewpoint that sort of highlights and just displays that clash. So. I got this model, I like this viewpoint, and for this viewpoint, the nice thing is that I can not only save sort of the camera position, I can also save things like any sort of hiding or unhiding, any color override. I can really kind of have this be very specific to what I want. But if you have a viewpoint that you want to recall, you say save a viewpoint, and it puts it over in a special window, save viewpoint. So I can save this. Super. So this is like kind of my uh, front aerial. Let's go ahead, I'll orbit around. And I can zoom back out again. Super, this is gonna be my rear aerial. Let me go back, okay. These are sort of um, camera positions that are easily recallable. If I click on that, it'll take me back. It'll kind of pop my back over, bit over there. Now, these viewpoints, everything about there is very controllable in terms of, we'll talk about this animation in a second, but we have the whole mission. Is it done in perspective or is it done orthographically? Perspective, you often kind of like, but if it's a little disturbing or it's hard to tell what's going on, you might prefer to go orthographic, which just sort of levels it all out, so there's no foreshortening. You have the whole notion here of whether you want to realign the camera, like align it with Z, which is looking at it from the top, aligning it with X, which will be looking at it from the right side, or aligning it with a Y, which will look at it from the front side. Okay, or well you can just go back to the home view, whatever it is there. Okay, you have all these sort of navigation tools. We're used to panning, orbiting, and zooming. Those are the ones that you're very familiar with Reddit. One thing we didn't do so much with, or looking around, so let's just talk about that and associated with realism. Because that's where it sort of gets interesting. Okay, how about this? I'm gonna go ahead and orbit myself around. Okay, and I'm going to try and get close to the front door. I'm going to actually go to go walking in. I'm trying to get myself sort of almost over the building. Okay, and then I can even sort of pan my way down. The reason I'm going to try and get close to the building is, in a minute, I'm going to turn on gravity. 
But if I turn on gravity right now, I'm going to just drop. Okay, because there's nothing to catch me. Okay, so here's my little guy over here. If I put the third person in there, and I turn on gravity at this point, when I go ahead and say walk, he's dropping. Okay, so I can't really turn on gravity just yet. If you don't want it on, say control G for right now. And what I'm gonna do is walk in closer to the building. I wanna be close enough so that when I drop, I'm gonna hit the ground. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm close enough now. So again, I'll turn on Control G. And now I'm gonna go dropping. Oops, not quite. You, not Control G. And I'll go walking on in there again. Oh, come on you. I thought I turned you off. Walk forward. Get on the concrete. How come you can't turn on gravity without collision? Oh, you, you, actually, no, you can turn them on independently. You can? Yeah. You can turn on gravity without the... Oh, it's interesting. Why is that? I can. Yeah, it's, there's something weird about where I am right now. Because it's, I should be able to. Okay, I'm on the ground. Now let me look around. Let me look up a little bit. Because collision is really a whole separate issue. Because what I want to do now is I want to go through and walk around a little bit. So what I'm going to do is come walking on over towards the front door just a hair. Okay, I'm gonna save this viewpoint. Let's go ahead and say this is gonna call the front entry. I'm gonna go try walking through that. The difference is gonna be if collision is on right now, I'm gonna hit the wall and I'm not gonna be able to go through. If collision is not on, I'm gonna be able to go through. So collision is actually control D Let's kind of walk into it and kind of show you what collision looks like. I'm hitting the wall, okay, and I can't get through it. Let me back up a little bit. If I say Control D, I should be able to go through. Okay, great. And now I'm kind of looking in here. Let me save this viewpoint. I'm gonna call this the elevator lobby. Super. As I keep on marching around, I'll say, let's go ahead and look over here. This is like the gift shop or something like that. So again, I'll save the viewpoint. And finally, I'm gonna go head over to those stairs. Now, as I have the stairs turned on, this is where the collision is gonna be a little bit interesting to you. Because if you, have, if you don't have collision turned on, you go walking right through the stairs and you'll even drop down to the next level. But if you have collision turned on, as well as, there's this whole notion of, oh, there's crouch which goes under things and you actually wanna be able to jump over things. But let's see if we can walk up the stairs. I'm coming towards the stairs since collision's on. When I hit the stairs, I'm hopping up the stairs. There we go. Come on up. I'm hopping up the stairs. Now, if you remember trying to do that in Revit when you were doing a walk around, that's actually pretty hard to do to kind of get the camera positions right and all that kind of stuff. But it actually is not too awfully bad here. So I'll go looking around back over here, and now I'm looking at the cafe. So as I saw a wall at all, it comes over in to me. Um, 
let's think, because okay, collision's turned on right now, right? So if I come in and I hit the wall, or hit the uh, little ottoman, yeah, it, it does its best job to hop over if it can. Although it's interesting. So try, try walking up against the railing at the side over here. I think there's, is there a railing? There might even not be a railing there. I'm gonna jump over the stair and I'm going down to the first floor. Okay, so that's kind of interesting in terms of what's going on. It's actually not too bad for moving its way around. So a couple things that come out of this. We'll talk next time about how we can make this a render view. It's really kind of cool. This whole, in this whole um, viewpoint, you can set the lighting, and control. Is this a shaded view or is it a rendered view? If you say, as opposed to shaded, full render, it'll actually go through and use materials. And we can sort of start putting materials on things. That's kind of cool. How that all works, you just so you sort of get a sense of that, a little preview. If you say under the render tab, we say Autodesk rendering. We have the whole idea of there's all these different materials. You might remember all these sorts of materials. If you have an object and you drag a material onto the object, it'll put that material on the object. Okay, so for example, although it may not make the most sense, we're gonna so have- pick up the materials from the record file? No. Um, no. If I say, let's go ahead and put the flagstone, I'm gonna put it on the wall, which again, may not make the most sense. You can do that. And then if you go zooming on in, oops, it's like I crouched up in the attic. That's not very good looking. Let's go back to the elevator lobby and do a look around. What was I looking at? Must be on the other floor. Okay, but again, if I say, let's go and take that flagstone material and put it on there, that's fine. You know, you can control how you want the rendering to look. Was it gonna be a low quality, medium quality, high quality? I like this coffee break rendering. That's like, uh, you're gonna go away and grab something at Koopa and come on back 10 minutes later. Or we can send it off to the cloud and do a very high quality rendering. Again, the advantage of what's nice about the rendering in here is you can start to render and apply materials to models that aren't Revit models. You can bring in DWG files or Tecla files or whatever and start applying materials. We'll play around with that some more next time. In terms of rendering, that's actually one of the really cool features. But what I wanted to finish up with you today is really on these viewpoints. Because you're looking at this whole front entry you're looking at the elevator lobby, you're looking at the gift shop, and ultimately going up to the cafe, and you're saying, you know, I sure would like to be able to do a little animated walkthrough and kind of bring people to all these different spaces. And you can. It's actually pretty straightforward. Think of it this way. Under animation, there's a couple different tools available. There's animator, and there's sort of record or creating an animation. Animator is all about, like, if you have a crane on the site, you want it to move around and kind of simulate the motion of an object. So you'll program over time some sort of motion, like a swinging crane. Okay. The other type, like recording an animation, is actually a little bit simpler. What you got to do is as follows. There's two ways to do this. I can either do what's called a keyframe animation, where I give it a few key camera points, and it just sort of moves around between them pseudo smoothly, but we can add more viewpoints or keyframes if we want to, to kind of like uh, smooth that out. Or you can do it by just recording an animation. The key point animate, keyframe animation is very efficient in that you only store a few points and it kind of figures out a pretty good path. Recording an animation says, hey, every second or so, I'm gonna take a new snapshot and then I'm gonna link those all together. And you can, put them, you can use them together. You don't necessarily have to use one or the other. So for animations, think of it that you're making little segments of animation, and it can be hierarchical. You make a segment, and then you can put it as a segment of a bigger animation, and you can put that bigger animation in still an even bigger movie. Okay, So you can really get very uh, kind of grand or fine about how you want to do this. But it looks like this. It's actually pretty straightforward. Under the same viewpoints, if you right click, you can 
actually find something that says add an animation. And when you say add an animation, it's really just a little shell for an animation. Okay, this is going to be my lobby tour. And how do you actually sort of put things in that animation? You really just grab the viewpoint and you shove it inside. I'm even going to put cafe in there just because it's kind of, we'll see what it actually does in terms of the path. Okay, so great. I've got lobby tour. It's a little animation right now. Now I can control things about this. If I go to and I right click and say edit the animation, I can control things like, oh, currently it's only about 7.4 seconds long. I can make that a little longer. I can decide whether I want it to move, whether I want it to kind of try and smooth it out between those different points or just kind of transition as linear paths. Make it a little bit longer. But when you want to see what that animation looks like, you choose it, or you can choose it over here. You say, let's play it. And again, what this is doing is just using the keyframes. Okay, if you don't want people crashing through doors, I might need to sort of have a keyframe, which does a better job there. Oh, this is interesting. I levitate to the floor, which is the most direct path for getting there. So I might want to put some more paths along the stairs and stuff like that. Or the other way to do that is as follows, because you might want to do this instead. You can say, hey, I'm going to go to the gift shop. That part's fine. Let me record an animation. Okay, make sure that my uh, tools are turned on under my viewpoint. Let me turn on my collision and all those things. Go to animation. I'm going to record. Because what I'm going to do is actually, I'm just walking. In fact, I should stop talking because it's recording whether I want it to or not. I'm coming up. Ah, don't go. <laughs> oh, I'm living a dangerous life. Okay, super. I'm going to stop recording. Okay. This is just up the stairs. If you look at that, you'll actually see that it's a whole bunch of frames. And some of those are waste frames. I know that just because I was kind of lollygagging at the front. <laughs> yeah, some of those aren't really ones you even care about. So I'm just going to delete those. You can kind of see any individual frame. But if you want to sort of tie that in, you can sort of say, OK, I want to put it inside my lobby tour right about there. So now what's going to happen is when I run that, we'll come on in. We'll hit the elevator, veer off to the gift shop, walk up the stairs. Okay, if you think I'm spending too long on the stairs, I can adjust the duration of just that subset. And then at the end of whatever that last viewpoint is, it's going to take me to the next viewpoint. So you really can create these very fantastic simulations you know, of walking through. This is a very powerful way of kind of sharing your building with people kind of in this like pseudo immersive way. You get this in shaded, but then uh, we can start making it more, photo -real more photorealistic. And if we want to export this and make a movie out of it or something like that. So a lot of times people play around with this you know, without everything turned on. You would know, have all the mechanical or the electrical showing and be walking through a partially built, or we can actually do sort of the finished product. It's really, yeah, a little bit of whatever you want to best explain the project. Okay. So, so you can turn this to the video for the whole animation, or do you have to go in individually, change it on each one of the frames? Oh, that's an interesting question. That is really interesting. So, let's sort of say we're over here in the lobby tour. That's OK. And you're here, there. And you say the selection tree. That is a really interesting question. I have all those things selected right now. 
So the question is, for example, if I take the structure and I just hide it right now, okay, and then I run the animation, like which one dominates? That's interesting since we're there. Come over here. Not there. I don't want to select all that stuff. Let's play you. Hmm. So it looks like your high level override could be good. So even in your guys' case, you know, we could uh, you know, do the overrides based on all vendor relationships or whatever's going on there and still have the same sort of walkthrough from different people's perspectives. So quite nice that the path is kind of independent of the viewing filters. So you can sort of like uh, construct a lot of different journeys for different people. Which is kind of useful then. Even that sort of makes sense. I like the fact that you know, the viewpoint is kind of independent of like what the filter criteria is at that point. Okay. You know, and then which uh, oh, you know, eventually we'll get it. There's this whole thing about overriding the graphics, and it's really even sort of blah blah blah. It's kind of over here somewhere. Override the items. We can override the color. That's how they're basically going through and setting up these color overrides based on different search criteria. So great. We're going to search for everything by vendor A and color I those red. You know, you know, we can go through and find everything that's going to be you know, built in the next two weeks and color code those red or whatever it is and help people sort it out. Or just hide everything that's not going to be built in the next two weeks. So that if you really wanted to, I think Andy, you have this idea, you know, of really, you know, could you get just the model at a specific point in time and then do some sort of virtual reality walkthrough, kind of seeing what should be there versus what you actually have through the camera, and intersect those. Yeah, yeah. and sort of idea. Okay, let us adjourn for today. Um, other good things we can do, I'll show you next time. Or, yeah, take this thing, display it on an iPad if you want to walk through and navigate that way. But you have a lot of good stuff to play with. So uh, go ahead and see if you can make some interesting animations. I guess this is kind of fun stuff. Sorry, I think I asked this last class, but I don't okay. I, I, a guy in the, in the project told me that he didn't know about it, so I, I, I don't know if I miscommunicated this What's information. That? So when you're doing through importing the model through the .nwc, yes. by saying it like that, if you update that file, your Navisworks model updates on right? If, it, if it's, it's a, you open it, right? If it's a file set. The file set means I have a live link to the newest version of the NWC, or the current version. An NWD uh, so for, for is locked in time. So for example, if I would have like a shared drive with this file called session one, the one that you yeah. gave If I were to change the model and save it in that same shared drive, and that's the, and that's the same file that was appended yeah. to this model, yeah. then it would update our line. As long as it has the new name, or the same name. The same name. Yeah, because yeah, every time you open a Navisworks file set, it goes out and grabs the current version. And it's, and it's dot .nwc. Yes. That's what I have to say. Yes. And yeah, Navisworks I, cache I, I, I think it comes to the information. Yeah, they get, no, it, it's really, there gets to this whole thing about file naming, why even if you you don't want to keep changing the name, you want to keep the current always having the same name, and then the old ones, like the one from last week, which I'm going to put in my archive, I want to pull it out and rename it and put it in the archive to keep structure.nwc. It could be a web-based shared drive. We don't have to be going oh, yeah. in the same space. Oh, no, yeah, exactly. It could be, you know, whether it's on Dropbox. Can you be opening the same file at the same time? Yeah. Can people opening the same file at the same time? You can from the standpoint, as an NWC file, you can do it because it's a read-only. You know, it doesn't need to change anything in the NWC. Everything you're doing is saved in the NWF. Well, the NWF is the live point. Yeah, so for what example, all these viewpoints are saved in the Navisworks file, the NW file set, the NWF. The NWC, those are all just the source uh, elements. But all these that we're appending are NWCs, right? Correct. So if 
if I go, let's say, if I go go to the actual folder and change that NWC file, like change a column, would that update the model? Well, I think in Revit, you'll resave it as an NWC with the changes. Okay. And then that new NWC will work for that. It's the same name, same locations, and everything. Yeah. It's just going to update and update for now. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's really, it's good that way because then, you know, on site, you, you guys can play around in the NWF all the time. You save your searches, you save your viewpoints, it becomes the master of everything, and you just keep on changing the data and everything. So the, the ones that are pending are NWC, but the one that I'm playing with is in NWF. Correct. You bring in NWC. There was you know, one that got locked. Which one was that one? NWD. Yes. That one's locked. NWD is, it, when you say, trust. Exactly. It's a, it's locked in time with the data that's in there today. Um, the data all stays the same. It's it, it's funny in that can you? I'm trying to think. I think you can still. We should play with. I think you can still go through and like add a new viewpoint to it, or even add an animation to it. Yeah, because that that'll be working on this and the we right? It, you're, you're adding information to it. You're, you just you fundamentally can't change the other NWCs. <laughs> it's um well think of the, the NWC as being the source building on the data. If I open an NWF file and then I attempt a drawing, then I'm using my NWF, right? But if I have yes. like a, a, a drive, an NWF, shared drive yeah. with an NWF, if I open that then I'm sharing all of my viewpoints and everything else. And yeah. then it, it's all stored in the NWF. That'll contain file. All the NWCs. It contains links to the NWCs. Oh. What you are paying right now. So if yes. you send someone an NWC, they're not going to be able to have your viewpoints or your they stuff. They have the raw data, but okay. if you really want to give them everything, you give them the NWF, which is the file set, which has the links and, and the NWCs. Yeah, and that they can change. The NWF, so you can edit anything you want. Yes. And NWCs, they can. NWCs, they can yeah. as well. Yeah. And NWDs, I guess you can. Then, then, yeah, it's like an Acrobat reader document. Okay. At that point, you can't make the change. You, you, you can look, you can print, you can, you can query, but you can't actually change it anything. Okay, you see what you can't touch. Yeah. <laughs> you see, you can't see, we can't touch. Okay. Cool. I have another question. Yes, please. Can you click on an element and like display all the properties, like the item or element properties you want. This is actually kind of an interesting issue because I think the the answer is yes. <laughs> But it's a little bit hard to get to. Okay, so here's an element. And you see over here, I guess this is called the standard view. There's different views of like how you go through and look at it. Well, that's the funny thing, because really what happens is the selection inspector, but I really just want to see the properties window, right? Right. Well, like so, even like only the properties, like specific properties, for example, things like to construction. Oh, exactly. No, and that's actually, well, you're on to a good one because I'm not sure exactly. Let me think about this in terms of where we can find it because there's the data tools. That's for exporting stuff. Let's try the properties over here. Ah, this is a window that I don't usually go to very much. But here's all the element properties, okay, for that one versus over here. This is this, is this chair and it's the properties that it has. This is this wall. Is the item properties, and here are the element properties. So this is a really good way of then interrogating just to sort of find out what do you have to hang on to? Because mm -hmm. what you really find one of the biggest challenges with the gold in the analysis is, great, this has an area, this has a length, like especially if you're going to do model-based estimating. You know, not all files give you the same information. Yeah. So a big part of what we do is just trying to unify all this or make sense out of it. Oh, you have an area, but you called it you know, surface area. So I need to go through. So I, I guess, yeah, you're right on target. The thing to do is, you know, go ahead and select the item. I can get that in. Interesting. And then go to the properties palette. So you can sort of see, you know, what's going on here. It's interesting because it has both element properties. Let's see if I can pop this out. Item properties, again, those are those high level things that all Revit elements have. 
element properties are the ones that are specific to that element itself. Timeliner is, is it associated with any schedule tasks? If you've already associated with some schedule tasks, those will show up there. And element ID, that's just a unique identifier. This is that thing that ultimately Revit stores. This is item 586600. Um, it's the part that actually maintains the explicit set. So when you create an explicit set, it has a list of numbers. And if you're not on the list of numbers, then you're not part of the set. And those are unique from, those never change in Revit. So from the time you set them through the life of the element, that's how it keeps all of this, the information sync between versions. Cool. Okay, let us break. And let me stop that.